Hi, everyone who's joining the webcast. We'll just wait another minute for uh, people to gather and then we'll get started. Okay, well, we are almost uh, a minute over our starting time, so I think we will jump right in. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to uh, Innovator's webcast today, Why Clouds Matter, Changing Healthcare with the Health Cloud. My name is Andy Burtis. Uh, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Innovator, uh, and really pleased to have you joining us today, um, whatever time zone you may be in. Uh, and I am super excited to be with uh, the dynamic duo of Dr. David Nash and Dr. David Nace. Um, Dr. Nash is the founding Dean Emeritus at Jefferson College uh, of Population Health. Uh, and he's been a national leader in population health and quality for uh, the past 25 years. Uh, so Dr. Nash, uh, a warm welcome to you. Thank you, great to be here. Thank you. Uh, and then we have my longtime friend, Dr. David Nace, um, who is the Chief Medical Officer here at Innovacer. Uh, former chair for over 10 years, uh, board of directors of the Primary Care Collaborative, along with one of our other great colleagues here at Innovacer, Dr. Paul Grundy. Um, welcome to the uh, webinar, Dr. Nace. Thanks, Andy. It is terrific to be here with uh, my good friend, David Nash. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Terrific. Well, we're really happy to have you here. Uh, and just a few points of uh, administrivia before we jump into today's discussion. Uh, you will see the chat box um, on your screen, and we encourage your questions throughout the uh, discussion today. We will do our best to uh, weave your questions into the discussion. We'll also have some dedicated time at the end of today's webinar uh, for Q&A. So if we don't get to your questions uh, during the session or during the actual discussion, we'll cover them near the end. Um, and we'll also have two polls. Uh, so just keep your eyes out for those polls as we kind of move through the discussion. Uh, we want to make sure that we have as much uh, audience partici uh, participation as possible. So really excited to get things started. Uh, and I think we will begin here. Uh, Data-driven challenges in the digital era. Um, there is no doubt um, that uh, electronic health records have had a, a massive effect on, on healthcare as, as we know it. They're an incredibly important uh, component of the digitization of healthcare. But I thought it would really be good to start here and to ask uh, from, first I'll ask Dr. Nash, when you think about electronic health records, what would you say are some of the major benefits they've created for the industry? And what are some of the challenges or unresolved issues that electronic health records have created? Uh, wow, well, first of all, Andy, great to be together. And uh, I feel like David Nace and I are, you know, two brothers from the same uh, different mothers. <laughs> so great to be together here. And uh, what a privilege always to be with our Innovacer team. Uh, that's a great question. Of course, uh, uh, we have a lot of experts listening in. What are the benefits? What, are, what have been the barriers? Uh, from a population health perspective, I think what EMR, EHRs have given us, of course, are access to physician practice data, the ability to profile physician prescribing behavior, utilization behavior, and what has emerged from that is something we already knew, but now we have uh, concrete evidence, as uh, we have a bell curve of physician performance. Uh, the vast majority, 80%, are doing pretty good. 10% are knocking it out of the park, really efficient, doing a great job, and 10% of our colleagues on the wrong end of the normal distribution need some remedial help. And now we have all the details to support that. 
If we could connect that to the outcome measures, that's fantastic. The other thing we're seeing, especially in the last two years, is those pesky social determinants of health being linked into the EHR for the first time ever. So that's a real advance. But uh, listen, let's not kid ourselves. We have a very sophisticated group of listeners. There's lots of bumps on this road. Six clicks to sign a chart, doing work at home after hours, total lack of interoperability, depending on whether you're a Cerner or Epic shop, uh, we could go on. So is it a panacea? Definitely not. Have we made a lot of progress? Sure. For old guys like me who are, you know, Medicare eligible, uh, you know, I could say I live to see it. Uh, but has it, uh, you know, delivered all the goods that we were chatting about during the height of the recession when this industry got $19 billion of our tax money? Uh, that is a very complicated question. Interesting. Well, I wonder, um, Dr. Nace, if I could just turn the question a slightly different way to you. Could you talk a little bit about the impact on the patient experience? Um, as EHRs have become um, very much uh, the norm within healthcare, how have they e either improved or not necessarily had the desired effect on the patient experience? Yeah, I know that's a great question. And you know, we, we should all should be about the patient. I, I wanna start off by echoing uh, both the theme of this and uh, of this webinar and also the comments that Dr. Nash just made. You know, there's there's been two promises we've had around this concept of digitalization. And most of us as consumers have experienced that in other industries, right? Or as patients or as members of health plans. So one is uh, the use of data, right? So we've all talked about things like data being the liquid gold. And, you know, it, it's tremendous. There has been more data captured, more data captured in electronic systems in in the past year that exceeds all prior human knowledge recorded. And, and you know, we, we experience this. When we go onto Google and search, right, we, we're, we're actually searching across thousands of distributed computers in less than 0.1 second to provide an answer to you, right, um, all around the world. And, you know, we go to, we all, with the pandemic, we've all experienced with Amazon, right? You know, I heard someone comment the other day is, I can't even buy anything during a week. I tried to stop using Amazon and I couldn't. I couldn't buy something without using it. And it connects literally all consumers, with all retailers, with all wholesalers. And behind that, all supply chain, all manufacturer, they all have their own view. And they do this in milliseconds. And we do transactions in those. But in healthcare, we have struggled for decades with the promise of digitalization, the promise of being able to have a single source of truth, the promise of being able to work together as a team by being connected. And to your question, the promise as a patient to be able to use their smartphone and, and have control of their health, not just their health care, but their health of being well with the applications and services that they choose, with a complete team behind that, that they choose working to perform to help them in that journey. Uh, we talk about things like interoperability, there's a lack of data standards, everybody has these installed data sources, and we have silos. The EHR that David uh, referred to, the High Tech Act was a promise, but what we ended up doing is we solidified the world in a world that existed, fee-for-service, billing machines, to make the business of health work. We didn't think about using technology and data to transform health. And that's what we're, yeah, that's yeah. what consumers want, that's what patients want. Well, that's a, what a great answer. And boy, again, for our super engaged and smart listeners, you know, 2008, 2009, we all forget, right? The stock market was at 6,500. We're at 34,000 today. Thank goodness. <laughs> you know, your 401k in 2009 was a 201k. Uh, so it's a different era. And I think David Nace did a great job outlining that. We didn't talk about consumer digital engagement in healthcare in 2009. That's for sure. Uh, it was prop up 
the nation's most important industry. I get it. And make sure it survives. Uh, some of this sounds eerily familiar from the last 15 months, but 2009 to 2021, a different epoch in healthcare, especially as it relates to engaging more directly with our own consumers. Well, and, and now let's shift our attention to the era of, of COVID. <laughs> um, I mean, there's so many, <clears throat> in some ways it seems that you know, almost everything has been said about COVID, and yet I think it's 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 an event, it's a year that will be such a massive turning point, um, really, in the history of so many things, and healthcare probably at the top of that list. And when you think about the the evolutionary path that we've been on um, over the last 15 or so years, could you talk for a minute about the specific impact of COVID? on this pathway to a new uh, a new future for healthcare and maybe i'd throw that question first uh dr nace to you uh that's great uh you know we've all experienced this uh, i i mentioned the experience in retail with amazon but you know we've experienced it in healthcare how many people have had a healthcare encounter using a telehealth solution just zoom yeah <laughs> i think i've had maybe eight engagements my dermatologist my <laughs> I had back pain, my physical therapy is done virtually. Like, right. and all that friction has gone away. That friction of getting in a, making an appointment five weeks out, getting in a car, driving, finding a parking space, sitting in the waiting room, filling out a piece of paper that goes in a clipboard that somebody will make errors when they enter that data. Going back in the room, having somebody take my blood pressure too quickly and then asking me the same questions over again before I even see my doctor. We must have been in the same place, David. That's scary. <laughs> so just, it's, it's been a tremendous experience. Well, and um, Dr. Nash, I mean, specifically within within Jefferson, yeah. what, what are some of the most significant changes that you've seen in terms sure. of this digital evolution as a result of COVID? Sure. So first of all, special shout out because I'm not operationally responsible. So special shout out from the top down from our fearless leader, Dr. Steve Clasco, who invested in telehealth five years before the pandemic, to our academic leader, Dr. Judd Hollander, who we recruited with his entire team way prior to the pandemic, to people like Dr. John Gleason and Bruce Meyer. So look, these are all my amazing colleagues who operationalize this, but let's not kid ourselves, right? If anybody here thinks that the business model of just replacing the primary care doctor visit with a telehealth visit, that's not a sustainable model at all. It's lower reimbursement. It doesn't lead to the detailed follow through. What we need is digital health going upstream with constant communication, monitoring, and real engagement. The episodic sore throat, rash, back pain, you know, I get it, I've participated, but that's not a sustainable economic model, nor is it a model that promotes health. Uh, I think we have the capabilities to promote health, but that's not what the new landscape is talking about. The new landscape was, let's replace what we can't do in person in the hopes to maintain some kind of volume. That was it. And you know, some good stuff came out of that. Uh, you, you know, we got the technology down. We taught lots of doctors how to do this. Uh, Jefferson was very proud for good reason of reaching out to communities maybe that we hadn't reached out to before. But none of that is a sustainable business model unless we rethink digital health, health assurance, and the difference between delivering health and delivering health care services. You know, more on that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and that's a great point. I want to chip in on that. You know, David, you really explained it very well from a particularly the telehealth and the consumer experience for care, moving into wellness, moving upstream. But running the business of health in healthcare, right. we are still in an antiquated world. And it's not just totally. health systems, it's health systems, it's health plans, it's uh, Pharmaceutical companies, none of these are connected, but as patients, we navigate them all. 
and their businesses are still running on largely installed solutions, 1990 technology. Right. Um, we're going to talk about how these other industries like Facebook and Amazon and, and you know uh, Instagram have all moved to the cloud and the advantage of that. So we're going to get into that in the pandemic for us uh, with our organization. We've begun to see our clients quickly move to the cloud and that's a behind the scenes operational piece that the consumer doesn't see. They see the telehealth, but they don't see the sudden move to transforming enterprises. Uh, and that's, that's a great story. Hmm. Well, let's, let's turn our attention to a rather provocative <clears throat> example, this notion of a iPhone moment. And some have, have written um, that this may be the iPhone moment for healthcare. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to get your perspective, perspective from both of you on what, what exactly does that mean to you? If you look back on this moment, putting yourself 10 years into the future, what would you say marks, uh, makes today the iPhone moment for healthcare? Well, I'm not going to go 10 years. That's just, I'll be way too old. Okay. <laughs> so I'll go, I'll go five years. Yeah, definitely. Well, sure, and we didn't invent the iPhone moment. I think that's out in the lexicon now. But what's what's really behind that? Well, to me, it's it's 1977, and it's Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Not the iPhone. It's give away what you want most, right? Okay. So how did how do we do that? Well, we make the apps free. So that's the sustainable business model. Let's get the EMR on the iPhone. Let's get the blood pressure, blood sugar, EEG, EKG, all pulse, respiratory rate, temperature. Let's get that all out there for free on the iPhone. Then we'll figure out how we're gonna manage this incoming amount of information. Let's get the social determinants on the iPhone so we could always be checking that. So when someone is doing a telehealth visit, we say, oh, I see you're in this zip code. Wow, do you own a car? Can you get to the grocery store? Can I send Zipline to deliver the meds to you via a drone? Is there a grocery store or do we have to call Amazon to get you Whole Foods? You get the idea. So if we could really connect people, we got to give this away, just like we gave away the apps. That was the most genius piece, in addition, of course, to the design and the technology and the feel, all of that amazing. But the real amazing piece was giving it away and giving away those applications. And when you think five years from now, what I'll be able to do from my phone, really make it frictionless. Here's how I know we'll make it, Andy. If in five years I could send the MRI I just had for my low back pain to the orthopedist using an app on the phone, that'd be great. I actually had an orthopedic office during the pandemic say to me, we'll give you, are you ready for this? A floppy disk copy of your MRI. Ah! So I'll know we made it when you can make that MRI go to somebody else on the iPhone via an attachment like we do for everything else. Can we do that in the next five years? We could do it tomorrow if we were really yep. determined and we had the economics behind it. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, Dr. Nace, I'd love to hear your version of the, the iPhone moment. Put yourself out a couple of years and what, what is it that, um, that we'll be able to do that will mark this kind of iPhone moment? I think David captured it well, particularly from a consumer perspective and a physician perspective. So I'll add in that sort of behind the scenes operational perspective, because in healthcare, we're running businesses, right? And so, um, you know, I often talk about the move to cloud, which I know we're going to get into as the iPhone move. And, and I believe it's probably here. So think about as a consumer, we used to uh, have a desktop computer at home and we used to you know, download an application, house it in our computer, use it, etc. In enterprises, that's what they do. They buy data warehouses, they buy middleware, they buy analytics tools, they buy an EMR. Often they're, they have a couple because of the mergers they've done and then they're struggling trying to piece these things together. But we're moving to the cloud, which means those things can be harmonized and synthesized 
and the applications, just like our own applications on the old desktop, can become an enterprise iPhone. And so what I mean by that is you can now have a system where you can actually house other people's applications, uh, build your own, and start to transform your, your business and, and create your own future, just like we have with our, with our own iPhone. So the idea of an enterprise iPhone, I think the moment is here and the, the, uh, I think the experience in the pandemic has begun to do that. Hey, Andy, I, I like uh, David's enterprise iPhone. We'll, we'll come back to that. That's very cool. But if you look at the attribution on this photo, we have to give due where it's due. And this is uh, Himan Tanaja and Steve Clasco in their great book on healthcare. Uh, which basically says what we've been saying, you got to go upstream and promote health. And the fact is, thank goodness, most persons are healthy most of the time. When we uh -huh. need health care, we got to be able to make that connection seamlessly, low friction, great follow up, no dropped balls. That's health assurance. And again, I think, you know, Himant, Tanaja, Steve Clasco, other big thinkers are, have been talking about this iPhone moment. I think it's great the way David Nace and I, we have our own take on it, but you got to give these, these uh, big thinkers credit too for coming up with health assurance. Pretty cool. Absolutely. Well, uh, this would be a perfect time to uh, bring in the audience. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to have two polls during today's, um, <clears throat> during today's webinar. And in our first poll, uh, to what extent do you think your organization is in the process of um, preparing for the digital landscape of the new normal. Um, sorry, um, there we are, there's the quick poll. Uh, so Joel, uh, you're putting the, the question out to the audience. And in the meantime, I'd love to just ask um, both Dr. Nash and Dr. Nace, what are your uh, kind of predictions on where you think this poll will, will net out? Well, I'll go first, I guess. I think it's going to be we're looking for partners and we're working through the changes. If anybody says they're all set and digitally ready, uh, that'd be great. I can't wait to meet them. <laughs> you Dr. Know, I, Nace, what's your prediction? I'll add to that. And, you know, um, when I was uh, uh, doing classes at Wharton, uh, Wharton School of Business, you know, I remember one of the classic uh, description, there are many in the history of mankind, of this concept of, of innovation and transformation, because these transformations, when they happen, they happen quick. You know, think about, you know, 15 years ago, did you have an iPhone that did all these things? Did you buy from Amazon, right? All of these things we take for granted. So uh, there was the idea of the shipping magnets, you know, the big sail ships, that was the way they, they moved everything, all supplies mm -hmm. from country to country. And, they, and these companies would build bigger ships with more sailing ships, more features and functions. And then these, this idea of a steam engine run on coal, these things would chug along and they were dirty. They, you know, these magnet people, they didn't want anything to do with that. You know, they created smoke and, you know, what is up with that? But sail ships depend on wind, steam ships don't. So this went on for years and years and they got to this point, which I think we are now of saying, you know, I might want to get one of those to sort of help me out when I got to get something to place in a reliable time. And then after that, there was a sudden shift and the shipping magnets went out of business. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what we are, I, I think, prepared to start to go through. We have organizations starting to do the digital work, but true digital transformation is totally different. So I echo what David said. Awesome. All right. Well, Joel, if we can uh, see the poll results, that would be terrific. Okay, the 10% are, Andy, this is really exciting. So I think as I would have predicted, 17 plus 48. Okay, so the majority are looking for partners and working through the changes just as I had hoped. But uh, we got to find out who are these folks who are all set and digitally ready. That sounds awesome. I'm, I'm heading there as soon as we're done with the webinar. Uh, you know, I, I think that's the whole point is, Knowing what the endpoint is, right? What does it mean to be digitally transformed is something that is a journey we're all on and trying to figure right. out. Right. Uh, so I, I would add to this scenario, look, right now uh, or very soon, 
you will be able to speak to Alexa on the kitchen table and say, Alexa, you know, um, reorder or uh, 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 my uh, Omeprazole, you know, and uh, have uh, Whole Foods send me via drone a, a great low reflux, low acid dinner and get it all delivered by the drone. I mean, honestly, we're capable of doing all of that right now. So that's what I think of all set and digitally ready. That's really pretty wild. And the yeah, zip line like drone comes right into the urban environment and parachutes down the meds and the food. Not, not too far away, and I'll add on to that another five years. Uh, right. uh, Alexa, when you come in, says, uh, Dr. Nash, I noticed your blood pressure has been a little bit more elevated over the yeah. past half months. I've, right. re I've sent a note to your doctor to up your dosage of lisinopril, and I've changed the menus you have available to reflect right. the right. right. And I'm monitoring the refrigerator, and <laughs> so you can't mess with this. Right? <laughs> Putting a lock on it at a certain time of night, perhaps. There you go, that too, that too. Uh, All right. Well, that was, uh, that was terrific. And I'll just remind our, uh, our audience, please feel free to uh, put questions in the chat as we go, and we can incorporate those into the discussion. So we're going to kind of pivot a little bit here, and now we're going to talk specifically about uh, how is the future of healthcare being built on, on cloud platforms. And, and Dr. Nace, I think I'll start with you on this question. So lots of talk about uh, the health cloud. And, and so, you know, the, the, the real question for you is, is the health cloud the next big thing, thing in healthcare? And, and if so, why? Yeah, it's a great question. Let's break it down a little bit. So, you know, we, we often talk about cloud and, and like to level set the audience. You know, uh, back in 1963, uh, the government spent $2 million on a research project, which later became ARPA, in order to uh, get, and these were magnetic strip computers, huge houses of these computers tied together in order to get more than one person using the same set of computers at the same time. Uh, that project became ARP uh, in, this, in the 60s. Uh, they started to talk about the intergalactic computer system. <laughs> the idea that you could, it was a vision, like we just talked about, you know, uh, with the future of uh, Alexa, right? It was like someday anybody in the world would be able to connect. <laughs> and, and it was people like, you know, downplayed it. It became the internet. And then we moved into what we can now call cloud computing. So to break that up, it's how can one computer contact another computer? That was the beginning of this. And then later it would be how can I connect to do computing power? And that's what the cloud is. The, the cloud is a computing platform that allows for connectivity from anybody with permission. And then the use of software for applications, for lots of things, security, everything else. And um, the health cloud is when you have a cloud computing capability, a platform that is specific to healthcare. And that's where things got tricky and it's why we've been a bit delayed in healthcare. But I think we're gonna get into that a little bit. But uh, the concept here is digital health how do we use technology to improve health and solve these problems of interoperability, uh, issues of standards, et cetera? And, uh, you know, I sent a, an article to David to read from McKinsey, uh, and I think he's been uh, learning all about the health cloud. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's step over here for a minute, uh, and then I want to go to Dr. Nash, but just to unpack a little bit more your comments, Dr. Nace, on how should we think about a health cloud as being different from the other clouds that we often hear about, from AWS or, or Azure or other infrastructure clouds? Could you just unpack that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, I'll make it pretty basic. Um, you know, we all know the idea of building a data warehouse in the basement, because that's where they usually go. And then uh, we've all done work where the IT people will create a data mark for us to access the data. Uh, so uh, that's the infrastructure, having data systems, having you know, all the security and backup and provisioning and access for all these data. And all the cloud means is I'm now accessing that through the internet. Someone else is doing it and there's huge advantages to having that 
kind of rent the space for all of those services, and that's the cloud. And then in the cloud, you know, there's lots of things you can have, but most importantly, make that data useful. And that's what we call intelligence, right? How do we then solve these problems of the lack of data standards, data from many different places, many different silos of data, and create a single source of truth to then compute on, because the cloud is a computing platform and to inform that with the experiences of the many people that use it. And so the Amazon experience, I, I mentioned patients, right? Consumers in the Amazon world, they buy things. The stores, the retail, they sell things. The wholesalers, they provide the supply chain to that all of those people are using the computer platform of Amazon. Uh, this is the infrastructure, the intelligence, and the experience that people have. But as a healthcare organization, you have to have a system of records. And that's one of the things EMR provided. You also have a pharmacy system, you have a, a, a supply system system. There are many different systems that don't talk to each other today because they're largely installed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a great explanation and maybe Dr. Nash will kind of invite you based on what Dr. Nace has, has explained to us, when you think about common use cases within healthcare um, and some of the barriers that we face today to addressing those use cases. Maybe you could give us a couple of, of examples of where um, this health cloud can really help to address some of those barriers with respect to different stakeholders in, in, in the industry. Sure, we could give it a whirl anyway, absolutely. Uh, and I think the take home message is that our industry is indeed late getting to the cloud and the cloud that we need is probably different than a Walmart or Amazon cloud uh, to some extent. So if you just look at the stakeholders, let's let's pick a couple of these. So as a primary care doctor, I mean, I've been talking about this for a decade. I want to come into the office, put on the office computer and say, you know, query it, how am I doing? Meaning benchmark my performance locally, regionally, and nationally based on my patients with high blood pressure, my patients with coronary disease, my patients with diabetes. We still cannot do that, not without having a programmer by our side to do an extract from, you know, the platform that was built for a billing purpose. So from a provider point of view, I think the care coordination, early intervention, and minimizing human error, that's fantastic. That's been a big part of our work at the Jefferson College of Population Health, for sure. From a payer perspective, I think it's even more provocative. Uh, they've already owned all the billing data, right, and the claims data. So they're, you know, they know more about our patients than we have. So now... Uh, we're going to see the blending and the lines blurring between payer and provider. And David Nace and I have talked about this several times during the pandemic, that this is going to give rise to the payvider. And there'll be more joint ventures, more provider organizations owning payers and more payers owning providers like United Healthcare is the largest employer of doctors. So I think that will create amazing benchmarking opportunities and also hopefully um, being able to evaluate what are the resources that gave us the best outcome? What drugs, what tests, how, how much time in the hospital and try to get to the most effective and efficient ways of practicing. So. Uh, leveraging the cloud, I'm very excited just about two of these stakeholders we could keep going. Uh, I think I'll add one more maybe, and that's life sciences. Look, there's uh, we can't pretend uh, right now, Big Pharma, they're the heroes. They created the vaccines. Okay, we get it. Right now, you know, they're, they're fantastic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we know that uh, drug costs are what patients complain about. It's the thing that comes right out of their purse or out of their wallet. Life sciences companies, they want to know on a zip code by zip code basis, hey, our products seem to be in great use in this zip code and not appropriately used in this one. And the outcomes do differ and it's way more expensive and there's more error and more readmissions. What can we learn? And there are companies that are already doing that 
and I think they'll be coming to groups like Innovacer uh, uh, more frequently to use specifically the healthcare cloud to get at those. So overall, I'm, I'm very optimistic about how these stakeholders can leverage the cloud. That's yeah, perfect. I, Go I'd ahead, like Dr. Nace. I'd like to add on to what, what David said. Um, you know, it, it, there's been a race to the cloud for some time. So think about that steamships to sail boat transformation. That took place over, in the long term, about 40, 50 years. But the actual transformation from 10% to 70% occurred in like six months, like when that tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell talks about this tipping point. So, you know, we remember Health Thought 15 years ago, Microsoft took a shot at it, you know, the issue about, um, you know, many Apple has tried this. Many people have made trying to make steps at how do you get basically remote computing, distributed computing to solve a problem. I think we're at that tipping point right now. It's one of the things we've done at Innovacer is to be able to help organizations quickly transform. So what is the test for which of these health clouds we hear about that makes sense? So let me kind of break that down. How many people on this uh, assist, uh, video webinar right now use either Google Maps or Waze? <laughs> okay. And so um, when you're using it and it says turn right and you'll say 13 minutes, there's an accident there. How many of you have said, yeah, I think I know a faster way. Right. And, <laughs> and you try it and you eventually learn that the information was correct, right? So you begin to trust the data, trust the information. And that's what has fallen apart in these failed attempts to move to cloud, move to what we call distributed computing in the past. And this is the kind of thing that we've begun to see is once that trust is there, you'll see that rapid tipping point in transparency. The trust of being able to make a single longitudinal record for the patient, the trust of being able to bring in all the silos in the enterprise and to be able to then leverage the power of the data to make it actionable and trusted. Uh, hey, Andy, we got to emphasize the trust factor and I'm not going to name names of big companies in California and elsewhere, uh, or on the East Coast uh, with famous people who thought that the, they could find a quick fix for healthcare. You know, so look, trust is really important and uh, it, it's incalculable how important it is. So we have to be darn careful about how we're gonna go about this, uh, there's a lot of mistrust out there, even of the giants with otherwise great reputations for, you know, doing these kinds of, doing these kinds of uh, projects together. It's very complicated. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great point. And we have a question in the chat. I want to try to connect uh, your comments. I think there, there are multiple, multiple dimensions to trust, obviously. There's the dimension of can patients trust that their data will be um, well cared for. That's one dimension. There's right. another dimension which has come up uh, from Michael um, in, in, uh, in our audience asking, there are also a lot of vendors who make uh, a lot of claims about uh, health cloud or just about cloud in general, whether it's Salesforce um, or whether it's potentially some of the infrastructure players or uh, as Michael notes, there are acquisition rumors out there about um, even potential combinations such as Apple and Epic. And I'd love to ask you both to just offer a, a perspective on with all of that activity going on in the marketplace today, how, to, how do you find signal through the noise? How do you really um, determine uh, which wagons you should hit your star to? And maybe mm -hmm. Dr. Nace, I'd invite you to comment on that first. Yeah. No, absolutely. So um, in the uh, technology world, uh, often there are these organizations called analysts that we often refer to as sort of the consumer reports people, right? For those of us who remember consumer reports as the reliable source. Now I think it's New York Times wire cutter. So, right. Um, right. exactly. So, um, you know, Gartner is one and they talk about the issue of um, they rate organizations and their ability to um, uh, ingest, aggregate, curate, enrich, and standardize data uh, uh, and give meaning to that data. And we've been fortunate uh, to gotten rave reviews for actually the past two or three years uh, by Gartner in that 
Another is class, which is more of a consumer reports view because they look at what the consumers say, right? The enterprises that buy these technologies. And that's another great source. In fact, class is actually working on creating a new class, no pun intended, of technology, which is this concept of a data platform or what we often are referring here to as that a health cloud. Remember, infrastructure cloud, all those services is different than the actual computing power and intelligence, which is a separate type of cloud. It's a platform in the cloud on that infrastructure. Uh, on security, because that is an extremely important question Andy, that everybody is concerned about and it's held healthcare back a bit. What we know is largely security is safer in the cloud. And I'll, I'll walk you through a few reasons for that. One is you have now have an organization that can focus their resources on the most up-to-date hardware, software, patches that, you know, if you're a hospital, now Jefferson's a big hospital, so you can have more than one person. Many hospitals only have one person dedicated to that in the organization, right? And they have a budget. And we all know how long it takes to actually make a budget approved and then go to purchase something, install it and get it up and running. So, uh, you know, it just provides this instantaneous updated versioning security. So there's huge security advantages to moving to the cloud, unlike the belief that somehow it's less secure. Nothing is completely secure as we know, but even installed are very suspect to breaches. Okay. Um, I think that's that's a great answer. Um, I, I don't know if Dr. Nash, there's anything you wanted to build on, on Dr. Nace's answer there? No, I, I, I'm still looking at the stakeholders uh, and yeah. I think we have to talk about the role of the employer post pandemic. Uh, I think some employers are, are finally going to say, you know, the pandemic was the tipping point. We're out of the healthcare business and here's all the information employees you go figure out what you need here's our defined contribution and uh, you know you, you go buy your health care which yeah. will make the transmission of information more important than ever before secure yeah. frictionless readily available uh you know i'm sure many of our listeners remember when uh, Dr. Don Burick was shopping for a knee replacement. He put it out to bid. He looked and looked and couldn't find any transparency. And the way provider organizations, you know, and the AHA are resisting price transparency, all of that has got to go away so that they'll be able to make a wise purchasing decision. And I, and I, I think that's, that's definitely going to be a cloud-based opportunity. For sure. Totally. Well, I think it's it's a great example. And again, it's, <clears throat> I guess, a way of looking at how do we measure the success of cloud from a patient perspective. And we did have another question in the chat, which I think would just be really interesting to spend a minute on, which is around the, the, the topic of how do we measure success when we think about moving to the cloud? What are the key metrics? Um, that would help either a, a payer, a provider, or someone else, uh, else in healthcare really assess whether they are moving the needle by moving to the cloud. And um, Dr. Nace, I'd invite you to just offer a word on that first. I, you know, that's great. I, I want to actually follow up on the employer piece because as we know, 50% okay. of healthcare is provided right. by employers in this country. And it's a piece that many people miss. And, um, you know, in terms of how, mu how much uh, focus you can put on as an organization, you know, these benefit managers at these large organizations, they only have a few people. They don't have the expertise, so they often rely on brokers. Uh, and they're not connected, right? They're not connected. I've done this for when I was at McKesson with you, Andy. You know, I often would work on that annual purchase of our health insurance or dental insurance. And I the data was in silos and it didn't communicate. It wasn't completely transparent. I didn't know what to make. It's really a tough piece for that. Mm -hmm. I think the crowd will begin to resolve that. I want to add, David, you would be thrilled given that you started the first school of population health and then college, uh, founding dean in the nation. Um, I had one of the country's larger employers uh, a call and, and, and said, to me and Paul Grundy and you were there, we want to make an employer benefit that is population health focused. Right, what's that? <laughs> right, right. And that requires that connectivity, right? And the exactly, yeah. So 
and it requires so, a digital front door and all this stuff. So um, really exciting news of where they so are. Andy, yeah, I, I think the answer to your really great question uh, asked by the audience, you know, how will we know if when it, the cloud is working? Well, here's my sort of simple minded answer. When you have a frictionless encounter and you share the information and you have your visit, the report comes back, it's accurate to the right person, all the technology worked. I mean, that's how we'll know that this is working. The outcome will be that it's frictionless and efficient and accurate and reliable and reproducible and very low error rate. That's how we'll know it's working. I, I think I think that's a great perspective and framework. And, and I would just throw in one other perspective that I've heard as I've talked to um, different organizations within our ecosystem. Um, and it has to do with, with speed uh, and specifically uh, speed of innovation. Um, and what I've heard from, again, a number of the organizations in, in, in the Innovator world is that um, with cloud, there's an ability to dramatically reduce the cycle time of innovation uh, as okay. compared good to- good, good point, yeah. I, I wanna add, I see there's another uh, question in the audience chat about how do you get people to unlearn and relearn? You know, I, I think about what um, our experience is searching on Google or looking things up in LinkedIn. You often get this greater experience that's personalized to your prior history and where it'll tee up. I think actually Alexa does this now too, where, you know, I've looked at your personal history. I believe you would like this. So what happens is the platform itself begins to learn. And, and it's, this is such an opportunity, David, for research to have all of these ecosystems uh, tied together to begin to learn. And that's going to be critical to transforming because that evidence will be there in a transparent way. Uh, well, it, it will also be critical to keep this private. Uh, this is where I think a lot of providers in particular, rightfully so currently, have a lot of angst about this because the same algorithms that are driving what I like to watch on Netflix could be driving, well, why don't you try this pill? Why don't you try this diet? Why don't you uh, ramp up your exercise for the next two weeks? You know, we this can get pretty scary right now for a lot of people. So yeah. let's come back and make sure we got that privacy pinned down, which is gonna be very tough to do. Uh, just look what happened to that gas pipeline and the hackers. I mean, I'm a little nervous about some uh, uh, North Koreans hacking into my blood pressure. Right. Okay. Well, and uh, I think we're going to move to our, our next poll question. And to those of you on the webinar, apologies for the operator error. Uh, as I mentioned, I have a, a four-legged co-host with me here today. Oh. And... Uh, she uh, she sat on the wrong cable. <laughs> so, uh, sure. I like apologies story. for that. Um, <laughs> so I think we're all in the COVID world. We have a little bit more uh, patience for these kinds of things. So again, apologies. Anyway, next poll question: What is driving your interest in cloud technology? Select all that apply. Um, and again, would love to to go through the kind of forecasting or preview game and. Dr. Nash, starting with you, where, where do you think we'll net out on this poll? Uh, let's see, uh, tire security. Well, I think uh, ongoing strategy and cost savings. Mm -hmm. and, and Dr. Nash, or Nace, what's your, what's your perspective? Well, I think this issue of security that came up is an important one um, because that's what people are concerned. Uh, some, in some ways, it's a myth. I remember being at Boston Hospital when suddenly they had a breach. Uh, so and they have all this stuff in the basement, right? The installed stuff. So again, you know, the advantages of cloud is you get quicker, more advanced and regular updates around software security. You get best, best that exists and they keep up with that. They dedicate resources. to it. So that's one thing, but there's always risk, right? With technology uh, installed or not. Um, even at home. Uh, the ability to launch quicker and your work world is moving so fast. So one critical thing about moving to cloud is your ability to compete. And I think that's something that I think most enterprises, hospitals, health systems, payers are thinking, can I compete quicker? And the answer is yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And can I, can I transform my organization? 
Awesome. All right. Well, let's see the uh, the results, Joel. If you can bring them up, that would be great. And let's have a look. Oh my gosh. Bingo. So by far and away, ongoing strategy of digital innovation. Yep. Does that surprise you at all? Uh, Nash here, no, no. I think uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, people are still trying to figure it out. And I think we're still maybe a little bit too enamored of the telehealth visit. Uh, what's the digital health strategy? I think that's the key question that 80% of people are appropriately uh, trying to sort out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think this tells us we're getting pretty close to the tipping point. Um, yes. I, I think David Nace is right. I, I want to connect this poll question to one of the questions that we have in the chat here, which is really around change management. Um, you know, the question specifically is how do you get people to unlearn and relearn, in turn, gaining the trust or buy-in for things such as predictive analytics to make healthcare decisions or change the mindset of clinicians who think they're critical thinking and life experience? Um, is the end all and be all. So when you think about the opportunities that cloud creates for accelerating digital innovation, there is a unique change management challenge that comes with it. And I wonder if you could both comment a little bit on you know, any advice, words of wisdom that you'd have for our audience on how to facilitate that kind of uh, organizational change. Well, I'll tackle it first. Again, uh, as somebody who's now Medicare eligible, don't look at uh, guys and gals from my generation to figure this out, which is a nice way of saying, go get those early adopters. We know who they are and model their behavior, use them as spokespeople. Uh, mm -hmm. We better not forget about the diversity and inclusion issue here. I mean, uh, you, you know, it's way past the three white guys right here. Uh, we got to, if you want a population to engage in their own health, you got to reach out and have the appropriate people communicate those changes to the population. So I think all the basic tenets of change management, engagement, uh, early adopters, uh, appropriate reward system, transparency in the outcomes, close the feedback loop, non-punitive, all the things we've been really working on for three decades uh, mm -hmm. to try to attempt to change doctor behavior, the same rules apply. That's great. Dr. Nace, is there anything in particular you, you'd add there? You know, I, I think, you know, David Nash and I have talked for, <laughs> I was going to say years, that's <laughs> it's actually decades. Thank you know, he's, he's had this experience of how do you train a workforce and get them to think right. it. But it's more than that. It's incentives. And then it's also and I'll use this term more loosely now, the platform they have to collaborate and operate. And that's the way that you get set up for helping the people change. It's about changing behavior. This slide you have up here is so important. You know, uh, uh, your boss, David Nash, Steve Plaskow, our, our other friend, he often talks about this idea of healthcare being anywhere. The idea of like, oh, Jefferson Hospital? Uh, I think we still have one uh, standing up in downtown somewhere. Because right. Healthcare is everywhere. But to David's prior point when we started, the social, environmental, and economic drivers of health are so much more important to understand and to be able to address collaboratively with patients and their families in order to improve health and reduce the impact of disease, much more than delivering services in that clinic with all that friction I just described. You bet. Right. And this vision here of a healthcare ecosystem of the future. Only the cloud can provide this. And this is the future that we are encroaching upon. So exciting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here's a great story. If you want to tackle disparities in care and inequality in care in a great city like Philadelphia, where one quarter of the population lives in poverty, uh, so to reduce high blood pressure and reduce the risk of stroke and to reduce lipids and to reduce the risk of heart attack, you know, it's way beyond getting the right pill to the right person, right? I mean, that's actually the easy part. The way more complex part is 
all of those social determinants. You can't get healthy food anywhere. You're too afraid to go outside to exercise because there's gunfire in your neighborhood. Mm. The poverty itself leads to genetic changes from the stress of poverty. I mean, so addressing all those upstream issues, only the cloud will give us the power to collect that kind of data and make appropriate inferences, tailor the care, tailor the messaging to the right population. You know, the whole notion of the tyranny of the visit, come to me, I'm the primary care doctor, I've got the answer, here's the pill, and it's your damn fault if you don't get better. Well, that's the model I grew up in, of course. Uh, my doctor daughter, totally different model, totally different model, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, so um, David, it's been been so thrilled to have you involved with uh, the work we've been doing in Innovator. You know, the the we started the company with this concept of the name of Innovation Accelerator, Innovator, in order to create a very health specific health cloud that allowed for those <coughs> uh, that compute power in a unified patient record from all sources, multiple hospital systems, EMRs, health plans, the social, environmental, and economic risk, connect with community agencies, transform practices, have people work together as a team, and more importantly, have dashboards and intelligence because you can monitor the pace and the direction of that transformation. But you have to unify the data, and that's what the health cloud is uh, for us. Uh, again, infrastructure clouds, we operate on any infrastructure cloud, uh, but it's that, that health platform, that health cloud that really can help drive this future. And we're just so excited to, to begin to work. Mm. Well, we're, we're almost out of time, but there are two other questions that I'm hoping we can squeeze in. One of them relates to the fact that, you know, one of the benefits of cloud and for that matter, digital health is that it creates this kind of always on environment, this 24 by seven, you know, ability to access care where you need it, how you need it, that also potentially creates some challenges for frontline workers who um, are, you know, at the risk of, of burnout, especially during COVID times. I wondered if you could just comment briefly on how do you strike the balance between this kind of accessibility that the cloud offers um, while also maintaining the, the sanity, if you will, of, of frontline healthcare workers? Wow. Yeah, not easy. <laughs> that would be mm -hmm. my answer. Mm -hmm. uh, be careful. Yeah, I we haven't chatted this time about a generation of PTSD when we do get back to face-to-face -face work. I mean, beyond folks who have been at the bedside, uh, they're the real heroes and heroines of this story. But the PTSD in our profession, especially nurses, uh, doctors, pharmacists, uh, our inability to address this, the social stigma, the drug abuse. I mean, we got a lot of really important issues, which are wrapped into that question about creating appropriate boundaries. You, you know, the leadership team, as one example at Jefferson, you know, made a very specific decision to limit certain email hours, response time. If people were working around the clock, you know, that's not going to help anybody. Uh, so. But what I'm suggesting beyond that, when we do return to some face-to-face -face engagement, I think we're gonna be seeing a uh, nearly a generation of uh, some kind of PTSD behavior, no question. Well, uh, Dr. Nace, uh, anything you'd add? Yeah, um, let me get the optimistic side of that coin. I think we'll find a new way to work. Mm -hmm. I think the concept of work as a healthcare worker uh, will change. Actually, who is a healthcare worker will change. We're automating so many of these activities that have been routine, um, as other industries have. So the nature of work will change, and we'll have learned. I, I certainly have been through my own path of dealing with Zoom calls all day long and, and learning to balance my life and make, make choices. And, and I think that the nature of the workplace as we return will change as well. So uh, I think as employers, we need to be cautious and thoughtful about the uh, concerns that David raised. As doctors, we need to be cautious about the impact on our patients, but we will figure it out. We will figure it out and we will transform to a new world that is a better world for healthcare. I hope so. Awesome. Well, we're just about at the end of our time. So I think, uh, so we're not interrupting you with your final comments. I thought that was a great place to end, Dr. Nay. So thank you and Dr. Nash, thank you for all of your 
insights and I thought it was an absolutely terrific discussion. Thanks to our audience for carving out an hour of your busy days uh, for, for today's webinar. If you do have any questions that we did not get to or any questions that occur to you after the fact, you are welcome to email us at team at innovacer.com and we will do our very best to get back to you with questions uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, please check out innovacer.com for um, our rundown of, of upcoming webinars. We do these on a fairly regular basis and our goal is to provide uh, content that's valuable to you. Um, so again, thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you to uh, our guests and I hope you all have a great rest of the day and please stay safe. Thank you very much. Great, bye-bye now. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you.